So it is an honor to welcome you to this uh, lecture entitled Black Christianity and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Um, we are very honored to have uh, Jeroen de Wolf here, who is a professor of uh, folklore, but also, and I, I really like this title, the Queen Beatrix Professor in Dutch Studies at the University of California in Berkeley. With academic ties stretching from Ghent in Belgium to both Porto and Lis uh, Lisboa in uh, Portugal, uh, from Bern in Switzerland all the way to Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, we have a uh, sort of a global academic here amongst us uh, today. Um, you can also see this in the fact that he has published in f no less than five different languages on topics such as German and Dutch literature, the Congo, uh, the Mardi Gras festival in New Orleans, and of course uh, the, pop the topic for today. Um, the Afro-Atlantic uh, Catholics, uh, on which he also recently published a book for which he received the John Gilmery um, Shia Prize of the American Catholic Historical Association. Um, I think we can expect a very fresh historical perspective on the roots of black Christianity, uh, but I think it will also become clear to us that this is not just a tale about history, but also has a very clear relevance for today. Um, with all of that being said, I would like to give the floor to Professor De Wolf for his presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, William, and thank you all uh, for being here. Um, what I would like to do uh, before I start uh, my presentation uh, is I would like to share with you a short video. And the video will take us to Brazil. And what we will see in the video is we will see a so-called congada which essentially is a Catholic confraternity that once upon a time was established by descendants of enslaved Africans from the Congo region. I will speak actually quite a bit about Congo uh, in this lecture. Uh, and what you will see in, in, in the video uh, is a prayer. Uh, it's a Catholic prayer, a prayer in honor of Our Lady of the Rosary. And so let us just have a look at the prayer session and then I will start my interpretation and, and my lecture. So here we go. So what we saw here is an expression of Christian devotion by members of the black community, in this case, Brazil. Um, but I could, of course, share with you other examples from other parts of the Americas, because we uh, know from, from research that Christianity is, is a religion of great importance to black communities in the Americas. Uh, a recent um, study in the United States uh, revealed that when people in the United States are asked do you consider yourself to be a Christian? The one community where most people answer that question with yes is the African-American community. Yeah. More than the Hispanic community, much more than the white community. Right? So Christianity is a religion of great importance to the black community, and that in itself raises questions. Right? Why, do we, why do we see this attachment, an attachment to a religion that, after all, is the religion of the colonial oppressor, is the religion of those who are responsible for, for the slave trade, right? Why do we see that? And, and um, um, a second aspect uh, is, of course, that we are all currently 
thinking about decolonizing the humanities, decolonizing social sciences. So how do we deal then right, with, this, with this legacy, this importance of Christianity to the black community? A second aspect that we clearly saw also in this video is that um, when we see examples of, of um, Christian devotion uh, among black communities, quite often this Christian devotion has certain features that are different from the way white communities would express their Christian faith. Right? You could clearly see that in this video, but you also see that in North America uh, through the gospel sessions, the, 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 the black Christian churches have features that are quite unique. Right? And the traditional way to explain those differences is by highlighting the fact that when the enslaved Africans arrived in the Americas, they brought their own religions with them, their indigenous African religions, and then kind of the, the, the missionary work started, and, and, in the, and, and, and the idea then is that um, certain elements of these indigenous religions survived, and that would explain then why black Christian churches tend to be different from white Christian churches. And, and what I claim in my book is that this interpretation is not necessarily wrong, but it is incomplete. Something is missing, an element is missing. And the element that, that is missing, and that I would like to highlight in this presentation, is that we tend to overlook that a significant minority of the enslaved Africans, especially in the, in the early history of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, a significant minority of Africans already identified as Christian before arriving in the Americas. In other words, they brought an African form of Christianity with them to the Americas. Yeah? And, and this community, whom I call Afro-Atlantic um, um, Catholics, um, this community, and I will try to demonstrate that in my presentation, had a major influence on the way Christianity among black communities evolved in the um, Americas. So what arguments do I have right, to sustain this theory that we need to add this, this additional element when we reflect about the history of black Christianity? The first argument I would like to use is the history of so-called maroon communities. And maroon communities, in other words, um, enslaved people who were able to flee the plantations, right, went into the jungle, established their own societies, free societies. And, 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 and when you then look at what is the religion that is celebrated in these maroon communities, in some cases we see, in fact, a, a, a return to indigenous African religions. Right? We see that in the case of Suriname, uh, with, with, with the Saramaka, the Njuka, et cetera. But we also see examples of communities where um, Christian elements survive. Yeah? So we see that, that enslaved Africans, they, they, they are able to escape slavery, but they hold on to certain Christian elements. Right? And, and, and how do we explain that? Uh, let me share with you here an example um, from Spain, very early example from the 16th century. I will share with you the original quotations and I will briefly summarize them for you uh, in English. And this is essentially a Franciscan uh, frayer uh, who speaks about such a, a, a maroon community in Venezuela. Um, and he then says, um, they have their own bishop. Yeah? Um, and, and this bishop, uh, he baptizes, um, he celebrates mass, uh, and when they celebrate Mass, they have a table with wine and, and bread, uh, and then they, they, they sing songs. And essentially, they seem to organize something that, that seems much more a form of Christianity um, influenced by indigenous African elements than the opposite. Yeah? And, and what you, the impression you get when, when you read this quotation, and in spite of all the bias of this Franciscan frayer speaking about it, the, the impression you get is that these people may be very hostile in relation to the Catholic Church, but they were definitely not hostile in relation to Catholicism as such, right? because they in incorporated several Catholic elements in the rituals that they would organize uh, in their um, community. Right? The second um, element I would like to, to, to share with you is um, that when you read studies uh, about the early history of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, studies like this one uh, by, by Sandoval, uh, who, who, who is a Jesuit, uh, works in 17th century Cartagena, uh, Colombia, um, um, 
works with, with uh, enslaved Africans who arrive in Cartagena, and, and he then starts the, 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 the missionary work. Um, and, and he um, admits uh, in his book that there are um, quite a number of enslaved Africans who already identify as Christian before their arrival in Cartagena. Um, where do these people come from? Uh, they come almost exclusively from parts of Africa with a historically strong Portuguese influence. Yeah? And this will be another element I will highlight in my presentation. When we speak about the Portuguese influence in, in Africa, yeah, it's important to realize that this is a very old influence. It started in the 15th century, so the late Middle Ages. Right? Um, the, the form of, of Christianity that the Portuguese brought to Africa was essentially a medieval Christianity. Um, it's, it's a form of Christianity, for instance, um, uh, whereby um, people would assume that Catholic saints can do very good things, but they can also do very bad things to you. They can become very angry and upset with you if you don't honor them in a proper way. Yeah? So if you upset your saint, there can be consequences for yourself, for your family, for your community. In other words, the, the, the type of Catholicism they, the Portuguese bring to Africa in the 15th century is, is a very different form of Christianity than what we see then um, after the Council of Trent and, and the whole transformation and change in, 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 in the Catholic Church. Yeah? And this is important for us to realize. Right? The Portuguese bring Catholicism to Africa very early, yeah? late Middle Ages. Um, um, the King of Congo, for instance, converts to Catholicism even before Columbus discovers America. Yeah? So this is a very old, very old history. Um, the second element um, that is important to realize when I say this is that Portugal introduces um, Catholicism in Africa at a time that, that the African continent is still firmly in the hands of the Africans. Yeah? Um, the Portuguese start a colonization process, but at that time in history, that colonization is limited to what we call the African Atlantic Islands, yeah? a number of small islands, um, islands like the Cape Verde Islands, uh, the island of San Tomé, um, that are uninhabited, and the Portuguese start the colonization with enslaved Africans they bring from the continent. But the Portuguese influence on the African continent is not um, kind of the traditional um, um, vision we have of, 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 of European missionary work in the sense that these are not colonies. Yeah? These are still independent territories, clearly in the hands of the Africans. Um, in other words, when the Portuguese influence, the, the Christian, the Catholic influence of the Portuguese in continental Africa is an influence that starts on the basis of partnerships, deals, uh, alliances that are established with Africans, mixed marriages that are established with Africans. So that's also important for us to keep, um, to keep in, in, in mind. A third aspect I would like um, to highlight in relation to Sandoval, when you read this book, um, you very quickly realize that we make a mistake um, by assuming that, that, that uh, the missionary work in relation to um, enslaved African communities was essentially a, a, a white missionary work. Yeah? You very quickly realize when you read such, such studies as the one by Sandoval that black people themselves were of high importance to the dissemination of Christianity within the black community. And I'm speaking here of, of catechists, right? people who, um, who um, assisted the church within the black community. Right? We see that very clearly in the case of Iberian uh, colonies. But even if I take you to French colonies, uh, we see a very similar process. Yeah? Uh, here we see an example um, from a French Caribbean uh, colony um, where um, the um, uh, French priest, right, uh, admits right, that the first ones to reach out to newly arrived uh, Africans are other black people. Other black people, and they're the ones who teach newly arrived Africans the prayers. They're the ones who take them to church. They're the ones who start the catechism. And they're the ones who try to convince them to ask for baptism. And only then they're taken to the white missionary. Right? So a very important role here um, 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 applies to uh, black catechists. And when you look at the identity of these black catechists, once again you realize that they almost exclusively come from parts of Africa 
with a historically strong Portuguese influence. Yeah? Talking about the Cape Verde Islands, the islands of Saint Tome, and on the African continent, mainly the region of Senegambia, and especially the region of Congo, which was really the center of Portuguese influence uh, in um, Africa. Now, um, all of this uh, made me disagree with what other scholars have written about the history of black Christianity. Um, scholars such as uh, Albert Raboteau would essentially claim that this Portuguese influence in Africa was not so important, yeah? that, that the history of Christianity in Africa only begins for real much later in the 18th century. Yeah? I have a, a lot of respect for, for scholars like Roberto, um, but here I think he is wrong. Here I think he's wrong. Uh, here I think he, he, he vastly underestimates um, the influence and the impact of the, of the late medieval Portuguese influence in Africa. And, and the reason I think is twofold. Uh, one reason I think is that he, like many scholars in, in, in the United States, fails to work with Portuguese documents. If you don't read the, 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 the language and if you're unable to work with these documents, you don't really have a good understanding of the early history of, of European influences in Africa. The second um, reason, I think, is that Roboto, like many other scholars who have studied black Christianity, tend to look at, at black Christianity from a post-Tridentine perspective or from a reformed perspective. In other words, they look for traces of modern Christianity. Whereas what the Portuguese introduced in Africa was a medieval form of Christianity that was often later no longer recognized as Christianity. Not even, not even and this is interesting, not even by the Portuguese themselves. Let me share with you an example from a Portuguese who um, visits uh, the Cape Verde Islands in the 18th century. And he then sees um, rituals um, and he considers those rituals um, pagan rituals. Yeah? But if you look at those rituals, in reality, they are essentially a continuation of 15th century old traditions that still existed in the 18th century. But he no longer recognizes them as being Christian. Yeah? For him, all of that is, is pagan. Yeah? Um, um, so he, he writes a letter to the bishop. Uh, he complains. He says... Um, uh, they, all, they have all kinds of rituals here that are an insult to the Catholic Church. Um, they say, they, he says, they select, uh, they elect their kings and queens, and then on Sundays they have processions, um, and then they ask the local priest, which in the case of, of Cape Verde in the 18th century is a black person, because priests were almost exclusively black uh, in Cape Verde at that time, um, to um, then honor that king, um, uh, and then they have an altar, and he says, but all of this, he says, these people claim to be Catholic, but in his view, all of this is pagan. Yeah? It has nothing to do with, with Christianity. And I think there's two reasons why he makes this mistake. The first reason, I think, is that since the 15th century until the 18th century, there was a process of Africanization. Right? Indigenous African elements were added to these rituals, so they started to transform. But there's a second reason. Second reason is that Christianity in his own country, Portugal, had changed tremendously from the 15th to the 18th century. So what was very normal to people in the 15th century was very strange to people in the 18th century. And this has to do, of course, with the Council of Trent right? and the transformation of, of Catholicism um, in, in, in Europe. Um, so how then do we, do, we, do we understand this early form of Catholicism that the Portuguese brought to Africa in the 15th century? And, and here I think African scholars can be of, of great importance. African scholars um, like uh, Felix Monteiro uh, from the Cape Verde Islands, who says that you know, these, these um, very biased um, comments we hear about our um, Catholicism in the Cape Verde Islands um, they are, um, um, uh, for us, very painful yeah, because it, it feels like these people insult our, our, our own faith, our way to understand what Catholicism represents to us. But he also says um, they uh, reveal a misunderstanding of what our Catholicism is all about. Yeah? Um, and then he gives an example of, of how Western scholars uh, who arrive on the island misunderstand kind of the form of Catholicism. And he gives the example of the saints. Yeah? Uh, and he says the saints, they 
hate sadness. Yeah? And why do they hate sadness? Um, because the saints, when, 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 when something happens in your life, yeah? let's suppose you, you have a child and your child dies. Yeah? Um, if you happen to be sad, yeah? the saints, he says, don't like that. Because the child dies, and that's a supreme divine decision that your child dies. And if you then are very sad and you cry all the time, you are expressing a kind of um, a discontent with this divine decision. Yeah? Um, so what you are supposed to do, he says, in, in, in a Cape Verdean um, Catholic tradition, is you have to occasionally break the silence, break the sadness. Even during a funeral, for instance, you have to organize um, laughter. You have to organize, um, you have to dance, you have to celebrate, you have to, to express joy, you have to break the sad. If you don't do that, he says, there's a risk that the saints will be upset with you. Yeah? Um, so a very different approach, a very way, different way of thinking about you know, what, what, what you have to do, what you're supposed to do to be a good Christian. Yeah? Now, again, um, 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 uh, all of that to us, um, and modern Christians, uh, or, or at least people who are familiar with modern Christianity, that, that sounds very strange. But the reality is, if I would take you to 15th century Portugal, this was very common. Yeah? In 15th century Portugal, dancing in church um, 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 was, was, was just another form of expressing your Christian faith as praying or fasting. Yeah? It was part of, of, of the way you would express yourself as, as a Christian um, um, person. It was also common um, in um, uh, 15th century, uh, early 16th century Portugal, um, that uh, black communities who were enslaved and lived in Portugal um, and had um, their own um, um, communities, they would, they would build their own confraternities and they would elect in these confraternities their own um, uh, people for whom they uh, then used aristocratic titles, um, such as uh, uh, prince or king or duke, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so essentially what you see is this is a very old tradition, a tradition whereby the confraternities uh, play a very important role. And this um, tradition of the confraternities is a tradition that, that continues uh, until the present day uh, in rural parts of, of, of the Cape Verde Islands. Um, let me just show you a, a very short um, second video whereby I take you to the Cape Verde Islands and you see very nicely um, this, this um, um, African interpretation of late medieval Portuguese Catholicism until today uh, in the context of confraternities. Uh, they're called tabancas, uh, these, these modern day confraternities. And you see this very interesting mixture of dancing, joy, pleasure, and at the same time faith um, devotion um, to, to the saints. A media, o povo foi meio tabanca, a minha raiz é tabanca. Tabanca, se quer estar de vim, que não lhe quer estar, se quer na carne, o que pode ver para levar na carne, para o molho de mim, tabanca, está ganhando coração. Eu liguei a Capela São João, por isso que eu tenho infectado, porque ficou bonito. E aqui está fazendo salva todo o dia, ele está. Yeah. So, um, what I have been highlighting so far was the importance of confraternities. You know, confraternities are brotherhoods. I assume you're familiar with the term, right? Um, mutual aid societies, uh, very important in late medieval Iberian society. Um, these societies were then um, taken by the Portuguese um, to Africa, but also to other parts of the world. And, and since we are in the Netherlands, I thought I would very quickly, uh, briefly uh, leave uh, Africa and take you just for a second to Indonesia. Um, Indonesia and to the island of Flores, in the very east of, of Indonesia, an island where um, before the Dutch arrived, uh, there, was, there was the Portuguese. Uh, there was Portuguese influence there. In certain communities, uh, a mixed community developed. Um, uh, descendants of Portuguese men and indigenous women uh, established their own community. Um, they, they adopted Portuguese customs. 
Um, uh, but then the Dutch came and, and the Portuguese influence disappeared and, and it became part of, of a Dutch colony. Right? Um, but in the 1960s, uh, a Portuguese um, ambassador uh, went to Flores and went to one of those communities and was very surprised uh, to see that people over there were still today praying in Portuguese. Although they no longer spoke Portuguese, but they would still say their prayers in the Portuguese language. They would still have the old processions. Uh, they would still have a bunch of rituals they were very attached to. And, and, and he asked the question, how is that possible? Right? That 400 years after the Portuguese has left, um, no Catholic priests have come to Flores, and still people there hold on to these, to these late medieval traditions. How is that possible? And, and the answer he found was the confraternity. They had established their own confraternity. They had essentially taken Christianity into their own hands. Yeah? Uh, and the result is that still today, if you go to Flores, you, and, and you go, for instance, during Easter time, uh, you can see prayers like the ones I will share with you uh, just in a very brief um, video uh, from the island of Flores. Um, um. Yeah. Um, now, when I speak of confraternities, um, it is important to realize that confraternities were crucial to the dissemination of, of Christianity in Africa um, in the 15th, 16th, and then later on centuries. But the very early dissemination, uh, I think these organizations were, were crucial um, to, 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 this, to, to the point that I would say, much more than the Catholic Church, confraternities were essential um, to the dissemination of, of Christianity. And you clearly see that in the case of the place in continental Africa where Portuguese influence was strongest, namely the Congo Kingdom. Um, when I say the Congo Kingdom, um, I'm speaking about a kingdom that was located in the northwestern part of today's Angola, the southwestern part of, of the modern um, um, DRC. Um, and um, in the Congo Kingdom, um, these confraternities were highly prestigious organizations. Um, for instance, if you were um, accepted as a member in a confraternity, you could not be sold um, as an enslaved person. So it gave you royal protection. Um, there were, uh, early on, um, lots of confraternities uh, in the Congo Kingdom where kind of a unique African form of Christianity developed. Um, um, a form of Christianity with a very strong indigenous Congolese influence. And you see that reflected in the famous crucifixes from the Congo region, where you clearly see the Catholic element, right? but you also see the indigenous African element in the so-called Nkizi, those puppets that are on the crucifix that protect you against e evil, evil forces. Right? So this unique blend of, 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 of African uh, Catholicism that survived uh, in, the co in the context of these confraternities, and that already early on, right, I'm speaking here about the 16th century, um, the ambassador of the Congo Kingdom in, in Portugal, um, in one of his letters, uh, explains that in the capital, alone in the, cap in the capital of, of Congo, um, you had no less uh, than six different um, confraternities, he says. Yeah? Um, and that's only the capital, right? And, and there were uh, many other cities with confraternities um, in the Congo Kingdom uh, in, in the 16th um, century. Um, um, this also explains then that it is in the context of those confraternities um, that we see this Africanization process of late medieval Portuguese Christianity. Um, and that explains then why certain traditions become embraced by these communities that later missionaries no longer understand, no longer recognize as being Christian. Yeah? Um, what happens in the case of, of Congo, for instance, is that in the 17th century, we have Italian Capuchins coming to Congo. Yeah? Uh, and they are confronted with uh, relics of, of late medieval Portuguese Catholicism that Africanized, yeah? and they no longer understand what is going on. Yeah? Uh, give you here one example. 
um, of, of, of uh, a missionary who comes to Congo, uh, an Italian, uh, 17th century, and then he sees that, that during, during the night, um, during Holy Week, um, uh, people have all kinds of, of rituals with penitence. Uh, they ask for prayers for the souls in, in purgatory. And, and you clearly see that he's at loss. Yeah? He doesn't know this tradition. Uh, but again, if you would send a 15th century Portuguese person to Congo, um, he would immediately recognize what is known in Portugal as the encomendação das almas. Uh, in other words, the recommendation of the soul. It's, it's a, an old uh, medieval Portuguese tradition whereby during Holy Week you would ask for prayers um, for the souls in purgatory. Yeah? And you would walk in procession at night through the villages and call for prayers for the souls in purgatory. Very common in Portugal. Um, again, but again, this is a late medieval confraternity tradition yeah, that was no longer recognized as such by 17th century um, uh, missionaries. Now, I've been highlighting confraternities, right, uh, in my lecture up, up to this point. Um, and therefore, it will not surprise you that when we now leave Africa and, and go to the Americas, um, uh, it won't surprise you that um, confraternities are of crucial importance to black communities uh, in the Americas, especially in Latin America. Anyone studying Latin American history and religion will know the importance of confraternities to black communities. Let me share with you just this one example from Brazil, right? Henry Coster, uh, who speaks about Brazil and then speaks about those Congo societies that exist uh, where they um, um, have their patron saint, in this case, the Lady of the Rosary, um, and, and when they then celebrate those, um, um, uh, the, 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 the patron saint in the context of their uh, confraternities, we have uh, illustrations of that, right? We have here a confraternity in the middle. The person with the crown uh, is, is the king of, of the confraternity. We see the music. Um, um, and um, uh, I should highlight um, that in some parts of Brazil, uh, these traditions still exist. Um, in, in rural communities in Brazil, there's still communities that continue to elect uh, their Congo king and, and queen. And, and mind you, this is not carnival. This is very serious business. Yeah? These people have a lot of prestige in, in their own communities. Right? Um, and um, um, within these communities, right, it is interesting for us to see that you find relics of, of Africanized, late medieval Portuguese Catholicism. Uh, and one of those relics you find is precisely the example that I just gave you in the case of Congo this tradition of during Holy Week, organize nightly processions whereby you call for prayers for the souls in purgatory, yeah, what is called encomendação das almas uh, in Portuguese. So let me show you a short video. Yeah? Uh, this is a black community in Brazil. Uh, they, they hold on to this tradition of having a confraternity. And during Holy Week at night, they go out in the streets and they call for prayers for the souls in purgatory. <laughs> Em alguns municípios do interior brasileiro, acontece durante as noites da Semana Santa um ritual folclórico religioso denominado Encomendação das Almas. Yeah. Now, um, speaking about confraternities, uh, Afro-Catholic rituals in the Latin American context does not really surprise us. Um, but perhaps we are less familiar with traces of these of this Africanized forms of late medieval Portuguese Catholicism in formerly Protestant colonies. Yeah? So let me share with you a number of examples from formerly Protestant colonies where you clearly see also 
traces of, of that form of religiosity. Uh, one example here is um, uh, Barbados, um, where you see um, uh, a reference um, to the fact that some of the enslaved Africans identified as Catholic and apparently were very sad that they had been taken to, to a Protestant um, colony. Um, and that highlights right, that they um, uh, acquired uh, Catholicism in, in, in contact with the Portuguese. Right? Um, this is an example from Jamaica, you know, a country where we, where we don't typically make this connection uh, to Catholicism. Um, but um, uh, where uh, one of the earliest um, uh, Protestant missionaries, uh, Filippo, uh, when he studied the, the uh, African community, um, he realized um, that they had um, customs very similar to the ones that I just described to you. Um, they would have a type of confraternity with a king and a queen, um, and then they would um, hold on to certain uh, rituals, certain customs. Um, um, at one point, uh, he speaks about purgatory, how important that is for these people. And he mentions also the word tata. Um, and tata um, is actually a, a Kikongo term. Uh, it means father. Yeah? So it shows us that, that the community who was speaking about was a, a, a Kikongo-speaking community, so most likely Africans with roots in the Congo uh, region. Yeah? Um, let me share with you this uh, example, which I find one of the most fascinating ones, um, about um, uh, the, the former uh, Danish uh, Virgin Islands, yeah? uh, where once again a Protestant missionary arrives, right? And he assumes all these, these enslaved people, none of them will know about Christianity. He approaches them, and then all of a sudden, to his surprise, he realizes that some of them already know about Christianity. So he wonders, how is that possible? He starts to talk to them, and then he realizes that uh, many of them, he says, who have had contact with the Portuguese, especially, he says, those from Congo, uh, they, they have their own form of Catholicism. And even more, he explains, uh, they do missionary work. Yeah? They themselves uh, reach out to other uh, Africans, uh, and they try to convince them um, to become um, Christians um, like them. Yeah? Um, I will uh, now use, because I look at the clock, um, and I will use the final minutes uh, of my presentation to take you to North America. Because yeah? um, we have been speaking about Latin America, about the Caribbean, um, but let us speak about, about North America uh, as well. And let us start uh, very briefly with a reference to uh, one place in North America that is perhaps of special interest to all of you. It's the former Dutch colony in Manhattan, uh, New Netherlands. Right? Uh, so before there was New York, right? there was New Amsterdam, there was a Dutch colony there. And these are the names of, of the earliest enslaved Africans who lived there. Yeah? And if you look at these names and you look at the origin of these people, uh, they have something in common. Namely, they virtually all of them originate from parts of Africa with a historically strong Portuguese influence. Yeah? And that explains also why the vast majority of them have uh, Iberian baptismal names. Yeah? Manuel, Isabel, Conceição, yeah, they're typically uh, Iberian baptismal names, right? And, and um, um, I don't have the time to speak about uh, Manhattan so much, but let me take you to, to another part of North America, um, um, uh, namely South Carolina. Uh, and why do I do that? Um, because South Carolina is, is the region in, in North America where you had the highest concentration of enslaved Africans. Um, and um, 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 when we speak about um, uh, South Carolina, um, um, we um, often speak um, about a community uh, that today is called or referred to as the Gula, the Gula people and Gula identity. Yeah? Um, and I'm convinced that, that the term Gula is actually derived from the word Angola, Angola, yeah? uh, so that they, that they had roots in, in the Congo Angolan area. Yeah. Um, still in the 1930s, um, when, when um, members of the black community in South Carolina were asked by someone, um, do you still remember uh, your parents using words that were not English? Yeah. Uh, some people said yes. And, and then they, they listed some examples, right? They said, well, yeah, my, my grandma, instead of tobacco, she would say musungu. 
Instead of whiskey, she would say mulafu, etc. Now, when you look at these terms, um, it's, it's very easy to identify them as actually terms of Kikongo origin. Uh, and that's not a surprise because we know that until the 18th century, roughly 70% of all the enslaved Africans taken to South Carolina came from the Congo and Golan region. So it's not a surprise that they use um, Kikongo terms. What is surprising is that still in the 1930s, they use some of these, of these words. Yeah? And I think you agree with me that if people still in the 1930s remember some words, it is, it is not impossible that still in the 1930s, they also remember some of the rituals that, that their forefathers brought with them. And some of these rituals may actually be you know, Afro-Catholic rituals. And, and let me uh, elaborate a little bit uh, on that. Um, in, in connection to the famous Stono Rebellion, which is the first massive uh, uprising against slavery in North America, took place in, in 1739 in, in South Carolina. Um, with a group of, of um, enslaved Africans who were trying to march from South Carolina to Florida. And, and why were they trying to march to Florida? Because they knew that if you arrive in Florida and, and you say that you're Catholic, then you become free. Um, the question, of course, is were these people really Catholic or were they just pretending to be Catholic? Well, the interesting thing is that we have a source, um, um, an anonymous source uh, from 1739 who, who speaks about these Africans. Yeah? And, and what does he tell us? He tells us that these are people brought from the Kingdom of Congo, here you go. And then he says many of them speak Portuguese and they profess the Roman Catholic religion. Yeah? So you see, I'm not, I'm not in, I'm inventing this, right? This, this, is, this is the documents telling us this information. Right? So these people were identifying uh, as, as, as Catholics. And you see um, similar references um, in the work of, of the earliest Protestant missionaries. Once again, the same story. These Protestant missionaries, they go to South Carolina in the assumption that none of the black people there know about Christianity. And then to their surprise, they meet occasionally people who already know. Yeah? Um, and, and the example here is, for instance, Francis Lejeu, right? who says, you know, oh, I, there, there happen to be a few, a few black people here. They have been baptized among the Portuguese. So essentially, he means parts of Africa with a strong Portuguese influence. Right? Um, they want to be baptized. Right? They want to have the communion. Uh, but he's against that, because he's a Protestant, of course. Right? Uh, so for him, Catholicism is, is the wrong uh, Christianity, of course. He, he doesn't accept them. Uh, but then he, he makes a deal with them. And then he says, OK, I will give you um, uh, communion. Uh, but you have to change your form of Christianity, especially, he says, you have to stop praying to the saints. Right? That's interesting to us, of course, because that shows us that, that in, in the early 18th century, right, there were black people uh, in North America who would be praying to Catholic saints. Right? And he wants them to stop, and, and then he converts them to become decent, good Protestants. Right? That, that's his ambition. Um, um, what is interesting is that in, in, in South Carolina, uh, we also see that the, the black communities, um, they had their own societies. Yeah, and these societies were very important uh, because it is in these societies that then later on the earliest Methodist black churches will develop. Yeah? Um, and these societies existed before the missionaries, like Lejeune and others, start missionary work. Uh, and missionaries didn't like these societies because they felt these societies had a lot of influence um, on, on the black um, population. Yeah? Uh, missionaries would refer to them as secret societies. And um, we don't really know what the origin of these secret societies is. Um, uh, many scholars have claimed that they were probably indigenous African secret societies, and this is possible. My interpretation is that, that perhaps not all of them, but perhaps some of these societies may actually have been um, um, Afro-Atlantic Catholic confraternities. Uh, and, and why do I say that? I say that because they have certain um, rituals that remind one very much so of confraternities. Uh, one of these rituals, for instance, is whenever there is a, a burial, 
Um, they would organize lar large processions where people would come in full regalia, a, a typical characteristic of, of a confraternity. Um, and then we have the case of Thomas Turpin, who's the only Protestant missionary who actually studies these, these societies um, and then comes to the conclusion that these societies, he says, they are very much under the influence of Roman Catholic principle. Yeah? Uh, and again, as, as, as a Protestant, he's very concerned about that. Yeah? Um, and, and, and then, so he tries to, to, to destroy these, these societies. Um, and then he's happy to inform his Protestant uh, readers that these societies are nearly broken up. Right? So he tries to destroy them yeah? um, in order to uh, convert them to, to, to Protestantism. Um, um, my, my theory then is that at least in some cases, uh, these secret societies may actually be um, um, Afro-Atlantic Catholic societies. Um, um, and um, that would also explain to us why then um, the earliest black uh, Baptist Methodist churches in North America have certain rituals and certain traditions that actually remind one very much so of Catholic confraternity. Uh, think, for instance, of the gospel music. Um, think of the tradition among African Americans to call each other brother and sister. Yeah? Very typically, you know, uh, confraternity uh, traditions. Um, and a different scholar who, from a different perspective, studied these, these early Baptist and Methodist churches um, came to the same conclusion. His conclusion is that African American churches, they have many resources and rituals that are taken from fraternal culture. Yeah. And, and my theory here would be that's not by accident. Yeah. Uh, and the reason is that, 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 that there was kind of this, this continuation um, of uh, Afro-Atlantic confraternal traditions brought uh, from Africa by enslaved people themselves. Yeah. Um, let me um, then, I look at the clock, um, let me use the final minutes, uh, five more minutes uh, of my presentation for a conclusion. Uh, and my conclusion is essentially uh, an example of, of how my perspective uh, encourages us to look with different eyes at the history of, of black Christianity. Uh, and the example I want to share with you um, is the example of um, uh, the church bell. Um, and um, uh, there's, a, there's an interesting book about Clarice um, Deming, who um, in, the, in the early 19th century um, travels the Mississippi Delta in, in North America. And, and he visits these, these, these old, um, early um, black uh, Baptist and Methodist churches. And, and of course, he, he sees that these churches are often quite poor because they're established by informer, formerly enslaved people, right? So they don't have much money, but they have their church. They're very proud of their church. And, and he's very surprised that, that there's one object that, that, that the members of these churches are so, so proud of. And that object is a bell, a church bell. Yeah? And, and he doesn't really have an explanation on, on, on why that is. Um, and there's, of course, then this, this, this challenge to us as scholars to, to come up with an explanation. Why is that, that this church bell was so important to them? And I, I don't have a clear, uh, uh, I don't claim that I know the answer to that question, but I just want to present a different theory. Yeah? Um, one could look at it from a traditional perspective, and the traditional perspective would probably be, well, white churches had a church bell, so when black communities had their own Christian churches, it wouldn't surprise that they also wanted to have a church bell. That, that's a possible explanation. One could also look at it, I would say, perhaps from an Afrocentric perspective, and then say, well, um, in indigenous African cultures, we often find that for certain communities, bells were of high importance. Right? If you think of the Congo, for instance, the Lunga bell is an instrument of high um, emotional importance. It was the bell that was, that was used whenever Congo warriors would go to war, for instance. When a new king was elected, the Lunga bell was, was, was sounded. Um, so perhaps then um, the explanation is that um, um, this was kind of an indigenous African um, ritual that people were still very attached to, and that would explain why then the church bell was so important to them. That's also a possible, a very legitimate 
explanation, but my book essentially encourages us to at least consider a third possibility. Yeah? And that third possibility is a possibility that takes us back to the old kind of Portuguese influence in Africa. Because yeah? um, when the Portuguese um, established, established alliances with African kingdoms uh, in the 15th and, and the 16th century, um, they would quite often bring gifts with them for the, the leaders of these African communities. And, and the same happened in Congo. Uh, when the king of Congo converted to Catholicism, um, um, he was offered gifts by the Portuguese. And, and among those gifts was, was a church bell. Yeah. Uh, so the first Catholic church then in, in early 16th century Congo uh, had a bell. Uh, and, and that musical instrument um, was apparently of high importance to the inhabitants of Mbanza Congo to the point that people would start to referring to, to, the, to the, uh, the capital as being um, uh, the Congo of the bell. Yeah? Congo di Angunga, yeah? Congo of the bell. Yeah? Uh, and later that expression Congo di Angunga was used then to refer to the Congo kingdom as such. Yeah? <coughs> because this bell was, was, was of such importance to them. It was such a unique feature so to speak, that they would use the expression Congo of the bell as a synonym of the Congo kingdom. Um, what we also know is that um, enslaved people who were taken to the Americas, they would keep using that expression. Yeah? And they would, they, would, they would keep that awareness um, to the point that when in the early 20th century, the first anthropologists would, who would study um, enslaved, formerly enslaved communities in, in Latin America and spoke with people about their heritage, their origins. Uh, in the case of Cuba, uh, we have this very interesting case of, of the Cuban scholar Fernando Ortiz, um, who speaks with, with uh, all elderly people in the black community um, and then meets uh, a person who says, uh, well, uh, my ancestors, he says, they come from Congo uh, and they call themselves the Ngunga. Yeah? And why do they call themselves the Angunga? Because they come from uh, an, a, a country, he says, where um, they had uh, a bell. Yeah? Uh, an, an Angunga, Angunga <coughs> being the bell um, they used. Right? So what, what does that show us? That shows us that still in 1916, yeah? people of the, the, the members of the black community in Cuba, at least some of them, still remembered right? that expression Congo of the bell and, and that the church bell. Uh, was, was of such importance um, to um, um, these communities. And, and when I, earlier in, in this uh, lecture, I, I told you that um, also in North America, in, in South Carolina, people were asked, do you still remember um, words that, uh, that, that are not English and that were used by your parents or grandparents or great-grandparents? Um, and I didn't include one word, um, but one other term that, that um, 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 the first um, African-American, actually, um, uh, anthropologist and, 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 and linguist uh, who studied um, the Gula community in South Carolina, one of the words he, he, he learned is that instead of using the bell, uh, people would still use uh, this term gunga, yeah? or ngunga, essentially the Kikongo word for bell. Yeah? Um, so that term survived uh, in the community. Yeah? Um, and um, um, so that would be kind of a, a different perspective, right? Um, that perhaps the attachment to the bell um, could possibly also be explained by a continuation of the awareness in certain communities and that they came from parts of Africa where um, um, kind of an Africanized form of Christianity had developed and in the context of that, the bell uh, played a very important role. It's a possibility. And that possibility leads me to my conclusion, a conclusion that will take us back um, to Africa, uh, a conclusion that um, takes us um, to um, this person, um, um, uh, Richard Burton, uh, who at one point um, in, in, in the 19th century uh, visits uh, the former Congo kingdom. And, and, he, and he finds there an old church. Uh, and he enters that old church uh, and he sees there statues of saints, and, 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 and in particular, he says, um, there is one, one object, he says, that people here in the Congo, in that old church, um, 
are, are very attached to. Um, and and that, that object, he says, is a church bell. People are still very proud of that church bell. Um, and then he looks at the church bell, and, and then he sees that the church bell uh, dates back um, to, to, to the year 1700, um, and it has a, a phrase, um, uh, a phrase in Latin, and that phrase is, si Deus con nobis, quis contra nos. If God is with us, who can be against us? And with that phrase, I would like to conclude. If God is with us, who can be against us? Thank you all for your attention. That leaves us with uh, how long? 15 minutes? 15 minutes for questions. So who can I give the microphone to to ask a question? Do you have any explanation of why the Africans embraced mm -hmm. the Christianity? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is it because of white supremacy of the part of the Portuguese? Mm -hmm. It's a very, very important question, right? Why? Yeah. Um, it's a complex question to answer. Uh, my answer would be for reasons that actually are very similar to the reasons why so many Africans embraced Islam. Many Africans embraced Islam. They abandoned their indigenous religions and they embraced Islam. Same thing with Christianity. Um, they did so in the sense that um, uh, too many of them uh, embracing Christianity came with the belief that they um, had an opportunity here um, to um, um, build a, a new alliance, um, a partnership, um, which could be a, a business partnership, um, it could be a political partnership. Um, it could be um, an opportunity for them to break away um, from some type of, of, of other region that, that was, was oppressing people in, in a different region, right? And by building an alliance with the Portuguese, they, they had somehow um, um, the belief that they would stand stronger. Um, uh, it could be the result of mixed marriages. And mind you, the, the Portuguese came to Africa as single males, right? And, and, and very quickly they, they uh, established relationships with local women, they have children, uh, and these biracial children um, then embrace the religion of the father. Um, um, but again, um, um, important for us um, is to stress that, that um, the uh, Christianity that will develop out of such relationships, partnerships, or, or even marriages, right, is, is not a copy of, of Portuguese Catholicism. It's, it's an Africanized form of, of Catholicism, right? It's, it's a kind of blend of, of late medieval Portuguese elements and indigenous African elements, right? Um, and, that, and that unique African form of Catholicism was, was in later centuries then, unfortunately, not recognized, not respected. As, as real Christianity, it, it was seen by, by uh, later missionaries as, as a form of paganism um, and, and, and fiercely uh, combated and, 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 um, and in many cases destroyed. Right? Um, and the sad story of this is that perhaps the greatest enemy of, of this African, um, uh, this Afro-Atlantic Catholicism, the greatest enemy was the proper Catholic Church. And that, that for, for many centuries um, simply refused um, to accept um, um, this as, as a legitimate form of Christianity, that, 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 that um, refused to, to accept that Catholicism is, is, is a house with, with many rooms, right? Where it is very different ways for you to be Catholic. Um, um, uh, you see that also in the case of Brazil, right? The, the, the scene I showed you at the beginning uh, the video I showed you, these, these um, Congo societies, right, with their very different rituals, right, um, um, had, 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 a, had a, a very difficult time uh, because quite often uh, local priests, Catholic priests, would not allow them to honor their rituals and, and, and to show respect to their saints in, in their own way, right. Um, um, this has luckily now, um, in the past decades, decades uh, uh, changed. Um, and, but now these churches or these uh, societies um, face a different threat. Uh, I'm not sure how aware you are with, with religiosity in, in Latin America, but there's a, um, um, 
what we see currently is, is, is the growth of, of Pentecostal uh, churches. Uh, and Pentecostal churches often tend to be very hostile as well uh, to anything that, that looks slightly, even slightly African, uh, is seen as something totally unacceptable to them. Uh, so unfortunately, these Congo societies now face a different threat. Um, anyway, that's, that's just a, a long thank answer. Thank you for your answer. A difficult <laughs> question, but thank you for it. Who else? Is, is, it, uh, <coughs> is it a win-win situation? A win-win with win, win. can you be a bit more, more specific? <laughs> <laughs> Who benefits by the black Christians? Uh, um, you don't have to answer. No, no, no. I, I'm just trying to better understand what, 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 what your, you mean. Your, your, mean. your thesis goes about. Yeah. Sorry? The, what was the title of it? What was the title? The title no, Afro-Atlantic no, no. Catholics, America's first black Christian. No, 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 the title. Black Christianity black and black transatlantic Black slavery. Christianity, who yeah. benefits by black Christianity? Who benefits by black Christianity? Um, is there a win-win situation win in black and white Christianity? Yeah. Um, um, I would say, um, I would say that unfortunately, there is little study right, about um, black Christianity, um, about the um, history uh, of these. Of these um, if, you, if you take the case of North America, right, with these black Baptist churches, these Methodist churches, um, also the question um, um, why um, um, have people embraced Christianity? Why are they so passionate about Christianity? Um, um, Weren't they just forced? Well, that's, that's my point. Um, and my point is that, that if you look at it just as, 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 as a history of oppression, right, it would be very difficult for us to understand why then are people so passionate about Christianity? Why is it that, that when African Americans are asked, uh, do you identify as Christian, that no other community, uh, there's more people saying, yes, I identify as Christian, than the African American community. So there must be a reason for that. Right? I, and I, if you look I at it just from the, from the perspective of oppression, it's very difficult to answer that. Right? Yes. So what my book does is it says, well, maybe a different perspective could be interesting. A different perspective in the sense that you say, well, maybe we have, we have overestimated the, the, the idea and the influence of white missionaries. Right? Maybe, maybe, maybe we should look at, at the black history of Christianity in Africa, right? And maybe we should look more at the role of black catechists who, who they themselves disseminated um, Christianity among other black people arriving in the Americas. And if you look at from that perspective, right? Um, well, um, um, it's a new perspective, right? It's a new perspective. Uh, I'm not saying that I have, have a conclusive answer here. Um, but um, um, again, um, um, we know for sure um, that uh, black people were very eager um, to um, um, hold on, um, um, or at least let me let me take you let me take you to the to to uh, Manhattan, right? Let me take you to Manhattan. Uh, you say you don't believe me, and I, and I respect that. Right? I respect that, uh, but but I can take you to Manhattan, and I can tell you um, that um, we have these enslaved Africans, right, in Manhattan, and. What the documents show is, is that these people have children, right? They have children. Um, and what they do is they reach out to members of the Dutch Reformed Church. Right? And they say, we have children, and we want them to be baptized. And, and the Dutch Reformed Church is very surprised and, in a way, also very annoyed. Um, because they are very strict about baptismal policies. Yeah, the Dutch Reformed Church is very reluctant. Yeah? Um, um, and and um, what you then see um, is that ultimately the Dutch Reformed Church accepts 
um, um, this request. Um, and we know that at least uh, 56 children uh, of black parents uh, are baptized by the Dutch Reformed Church. Um, but ultimately, more and more um, black people come to, to, to the Dutch Reformed Church, want to have their children baptized, and, and at one point the Dutch Reformed Church stops. Uh, it no longer uh, accepts black people for baptism. Um, and the reason is that um, um, the Dutch Reformed Church um, 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 becomes concerned um, uh, about the fact that um, slave owners um, have concerns that if children are baptized in the Dutch Reformed Church, that once they become adults, they will no longer be able to sell them as, as slaves. Right? So they pressure the Dutch Reformed Church and they say, this is way too dangerous. Um, we, have, we want you to stop um, baptizing uh, the children of, of enslaved Africans. Um, and, then they, and then they stop. Um, but but um, what, I can, what I can tell you, as, as a matter of fact, is that it was members of this community themselves reaching out to the Dutch Reformed Church, asking for baptism. Was this because they, they were Christian? Or was this just for opportunistic reasons? Because they thought, well, if my child is baptized, then maybe um, my child will have better opportunities to, okay. to acquire freedom. There will be a benefit. That's a possibility, too. Right? But just some background information. That, that for us is interesting to think about. And once again, look at their origin. Right? It's all parts of Africa with a historically strong Portuguese influence. All of them have, have, have Iberian Catholic baptismal names. Right? Right? And, I, and I don't think that's, that's something we should, we should ignore. Anyway, but thank you for your question. Yeah, very good. Uh, Next question. You spoke about um, uh, mixed marriages. Yeah. And I was wondering, um, marriage is also... Uh, uh, Christian mm -hmm. concept, so isn't that uh, then also a form of wi uh, white supremacy and a form of forcing the, the African people uh, in this process of adapting mm -hmm. the Christian mm -hmm. religion? Mm -hmm. um, forcing, yeah. Um, you know, it's difficult for me to assess, right, the, 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 the point of view of these women. Yeah? Why would women marry these, these Portuguese men uh, who, who came. Uh, were they forced? Did they do it because they, they wanted to do it? It's difficult for me to assess. Uh, what I can say is that they have children. Right? Uh, and what I can also say is that these children um, 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 adopt um, um, several uh, Iberian uh, identity markers. Um, so they uh, use an Iberian name. Um, they uh, identify themselves as Catholic. Um, they um, um, clothe themselves in, in an Iberian way. Um, and they speak an Iberian language. Um, um, but what I can also say is then when, when Portuguese from the Portuguese continent arrive in Africa and they meet these biracial children, right? Um, and, and then they hear them speaking Portuguese and then they hear them saying, oh, I am Catholic. They don't take that seriously. They, they look down upon them and they say, oh, you, you only pretend to be Portuguese, uh, but your Catholicism is, is a pagan form of Catholicism that is not the real Catholicism. Uh, your Portuguese is not the correct Portuguese. Um, it's it's, it's a, a, a degenerated form of Catholicism, etc. Um, so that is what I can, can say to this question. So, so uh, yeah, racism is very much part of, of, of that story, undoubtedly. Right? Um, um, but as a matter of fact, what you do see is, 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 is that some Iberian identity markers are embraced, but an Africanized form of these, of these markers. That's Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. have a couple of minutes. Uh, oh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I'm not a Christian, so yeah. um, if mm -hmm. I say something correctly, please correct me. Yeah. Also, after hearing your questions, I'm not sure if you can answer this question, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I'm still curious. Go ahead. Uh, we were talking about a women's situation and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Um, I do have uh, Christian friends, and mm -hmm. uh, they said that it's said in the Bible that Jesus mm -hmm. 
has a uh, skin color as bronze and that his hair is like a uh, wall, uh, the texture of mm -hmm, wall. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are people who believe that Jesus is uh, colored and if he's not only colored, he's like black African. Mm -hmm. So my question is, yeah. if that's the case, why do black Christians pray to a white Jesus? Mm -hmm. Is that something like you can elaborate? I'm actually very curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank <laughs> you. No, no, it's 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 a very interesting uh, uh, um, question, and it's 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 a complex uh, question as well. Um, what I can't say. Um, let's see. What comes to mind is Congo. Um, I, I, we spoke about Congo quite a bit, right? Um, so Congo, a late 15th century, a new king uh, builds this alliance with the Portuguese and then uh, identifies himself as, as Catholic, um, calls his kingdom a Catholic kingdom, builds this alliance, uh, etc. cetera. Um, 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 but uh, very early on, uh, what we find in the case of Congo is a tendency to interpret the Bible from an African perspective. Um, that um, even leads to the conviction that um, Jesus is born in Africa and that Jesus is African. Um, and, um, um, and, and, and that's an interesting process that goes in the direction of, of what you said, right? that, that, you, that you Africanize um, uh, the religion. Um, 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 we also see um, um, then in the case of Latin America um, that um, these confraternities that are established by, by members of the enslaved community, um, that quite often the, the, the patron saint they choose uh, happens to be a black saint. Because yeah? uh, there's quite a number of, of black saints. Right? Um, 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 and... and um, 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 still today, um, um, among the, the most important uh, celebrations in, 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 in black communities uh, in Brazil, for instance, um, um, are um, uh, the celebrations of St. Benedict. Um, St. Benedict, the, the black saint, for instance. Right? Um, so skin color, right? uh, race, definitely plays, plays a major role uh, into that. It, it's not... I, I know I'm not answering your question <laughs> completely, but at least it's, it's some, some ideas and some thoughts that go, go pretty much in, into the direction of, of what your friends are saying, right? That, that um, it's not a contradiction to be proud of your African heritage and to be proud to be a Christian. Yeah? And, uh, and, and I think my, my story also, also um, strengthens that conviction. Well, the Bible, is it, it's all about interpretation, right? It's stories, and, and it's about how you read these stories and, and, and what you make out of it. Um, and all of us have a different right, heritage and, and, and uh, a different history. Um, and, and to all of this, um, this, this, this history can mean something different. Right? Uh, and I think that's perhaps one of the strengths of Christianity, that, is a, that it allows us to do this. Right? Uh, but unfortunately, as I said, um, um, the Catholic Church has a history of opposition uh, against that, right? Um, uh, and many other churches um, also have had very problematic attitudes vis-a-vis -vis people who, who wanted the freedom to interpret the Bible in their own way, right? Um, 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 but um, um, at the same time, right, we, we um, uh, still see um, societies um, um, in present-day uh, Latin America, for instance, as the one that I started with, right? People hold on um, to these traditions. In spite of all the discrimination and oppression, etc., uh, they still hold firm, right? And, and, and they say we're, we're a proud Congo society and we have our own way to pray. Uh, and, and, and in spite of, of all hostility, they still do that. I think we, with that, we have to wrap, wrap up at least this part of today's uh, um, uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor de Boer, for this very inspiring and interesting uh, perspective. And thank you.
very much. Thank you.